Welcome to the Meta Business Podcast. The metaverse and Web3 are bringing about the biggest revolution since the internet itself. With your hosts, Paul the Prophet Dawalibi and Jeff the Juice Cohen, we will be bringing you the latest metaverse business news and insight into what it all means. The Meta Business Podcast starts now. From the boardroom to the metaverse, this is the Meta Business Podcast. I am Paul the Prophet Dawalimi. I'm joined today by my friend and co-host, Jeff the Juice Cohen. For those of you who are new here, welcome to the official podcast of the metaverse. What we do is we cover the most pressing metaverse topics and news of the week, but we look at all of it through a business and C-suite lens. We dissect, we analyze the business implications of everything happening in this amazing industry. For our regular listeners, thank you guys for tuning in every single week. Thank you for leaving those reviews, the five-star ratings and reviews. We, I promise we read all of them. They're all so humbling. Um, the feedback has been amazing. We really appreciate it. If you haven't yet, make sure you hit subscribe on the podcast so you get alerted when new episodes drop every single week. And also share the podcast with a friend, a colleague, someone who's maybe interested in the metaverse or Web3, someone who maybe doesn't know much about it. Uh, always fun to introduce new people to the show. Jeff, how you doing this week? Pretty good. Pretty good. Funny, my, my, my cousin actually texted me like the other day and, and I guess he must have been with my mom or something. And he's like, hey, I already have a new podcast. So he's now, now a listener. <laughs> Which is oh, that's cool. awesome. So there's always yeah. there's always new listeners, you know, rolling in. Even family members sometimes, you know, aren't aren't necessarily aware. So hey Johnny, that's if it. you're listening to this episode. And yeah, it's good to it's good to continue <laughs> getting more listeners. But it's a it's a good it's a good uh it's a good thought, right? Just force it on your family. If you love the podcast, sit them all down. You know how they used to go through like slides from your family vacation. Just sit the whole family down and make them all listen to the podcast or at least subscribe. I think this is this is the way to do it's it. Value, it's value add for everyone. <laughs> Um, we've got a ton of stories, so let's jump into it, Jeff, this week. Let's start with, as we usually do, something maybe a little bit lighter. And uh, the headline here is, Crypto Project Solana is opening a store in New York City. Take a look inside. So um, basically, this is called Solana Spaces. It's the first permanent retail store funded by the Solana Foundation. It's going to be in Hudson Yards Mall in Manhattan, which, if you don't know, is a pretty fancy upscale mall um, in in New York City. And uh, what they're saying is uh, the store, uh, according to this, is like a it, it's it's selling physical goods, um, but also selling digital goods with Solana Pay accepted, obviously everywhere, right? So the idea is to onboard people into the crypto space. There's a private booth for people to set up their wallets. Uh, you know, write down. It says their seed phrase. You know, so so they can access it. Should they, you know, should they what need is the to? What physical? What will they physically be selling? Um, I just from the photos, it looked like hoodies and things like that, oh, right? Uh, like uh, merch. Uh, I don't, merch, yeah. Um, but then you know, so that it says there's branded merch everywhere, and um, again, the the goal, according to them, according to the Solana team and the CEO of Solana Spaces, is what they say is they're saying it's really around education, right? It says ultimately the store is an experiment that we think a lot of people will love. It's not uh, obviously the, the 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 author here says it's an expensive experiment because rent in a place like Hudson Yards is obviously quite high. So, but at the same time, like, is it? Because it's funny. Like as you were talking, I jotted down on my notebook literally cheap marketing. So maybe I, I disagree. <laughs> like, like to me, like this seems like actually a decently cheap form of marketing. Uh, first thing comes to, to mind what? clearly, you know, like a Super Bowl ad. Uh, okay. <laughs> um. I guess maybe not in terms of reach, but but clearly cheaper than Super Bowl ad. Um, first thing that comes to mind, and if you're not watching the video, maybe you'll have to just Google it or, or go check it out. It looks exactly like an Apple store. It, it, they've yeah. clearly modeled it on that, uh, as as many you know, retail do. So yeah, I was going to say that's like almost all of retail since the Apple Store came out. Yeah. So I mean, initially, I, I, I was I was ready to hate this. I was all ready to say this is another example of the the excess and the just ridiculousness of Web three. And what is the point of this? It's a phys- you know, it's an in- piece of infrastructure and digital technology. Why do they need a physical store? But then I was thinking about like some of the things you said and just the onboarding process for crypto. It, I almost view this as like a really good geek squad, right? Like if you want to get people into crypto, they need 
like a certain demographic of people needs to have a person, right? They need to be able to talk to someone. It's like, how do I get, how do I put money onto my wallet? How do I buy something with crypto? Do it for me. How do I create my seed phrase, my password? Help me. So I kind of think, think that it could be the equivalent of that, where it's almost like becomes a little bit of like a geek squad where people, it, it onboards a lot. Like you're walking through there, you're like, okay, this is cool. Let me go check it out. Let me ask some stupid questions. And maybe you bring more people into the ecosystem. Like, will this store make money or provide a great ROI, you know, for Solana? At the end of the day, I, I probably doubt it, but it's kind of a good thing for the ecosystem, actually. Like, I just think it, it will, it will educate folks. You but know. will it? Will it really? I, I think so. Like, maybe. Like, I don't know. Like, how many people, like, honestly, do you think will go through this store on a daily basis? Probably a decent amount. Like, if you're just, you know, browsing through the mall, it's a pretty high-end mall. Okay. I know you, you obviously know it well. Yeah. Uh, how, many, how many crypto wallets do you think they'll activate in a day? Uh, 75. I don't. I don't think it'll be anywhere near that. Like, I, 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 I figure like two an hour, maybe. Right? There's like one or two of these pods, right? Like two an hour, something like that. You're talking like sixteen wallets activated in an eight hour kind of work day ish. Um, like back of the envelope math. If the space costs them a hundred grand a month, and it, it may be more actually, because I, I don't know what you know, real estate uh, like uh, retail space costs in Hudson Yards, but. I did the back of the envelope math. Like you're talking about a, a cost of customer acquisition, even I think in the most conservative scenarios around $200. But like that actually is not that bad, I think. Like I, I mean, <laughs> like aren't um, certain, you know, like I think crypto.com, like a lot of these companies have been paying like, you know, massive sign-on fees. Like if you, if you join their, um, you know, their exchange, like they'll give you $50 free or $25 free. So like, $200 customer acquisition cost actually like, you know, doesn't strike me as that high. Um, now I think Solana, yeah. maybe they're looking for more B2B. So maybe they're, they're, they're looking just to generate it's, it's a high end mall. You get the right kind of people in there. Maybe they think, okay, you're, you're getting executives that aren't get the tastemakers. Exactly. You exactly. Say. You kind of get the tastemakers, the decision makers to kind of, to come through there and then they get hooked and, it also creates a brand halo, right? You have this great store, this great mall, and it becomes all of a sudden Solana edges themselves above the competition, just in the mind share of the right people. Like you are talking about yeah. that there are hedge funds in that in that space. It's you know all sorts of titans of industry walking through that mall. So I don't know, maybe that maybe it makes sense. I mean, you're talking about spend though that is on the order of a Super Bowl ad, right? Like between rent, outfitting it, people. Right, like you're talking millions of dollars at this point. Um, I don't know. Like maybe it was they were better off just like sponsoring a Mr. Beast. So here's the question: you know what I mean? you think, And maybe this, maybe this was mentioned in the article. Maybe it wasn't, and maybe they have this decision made, and maybe they don't. Do you think this was a one-off? Like, kind of, we'll see this for six months as almost like a pop-up shop, or is this going to be part of a broader? There's going to be one in Miami. There's going to be one in San Francisco. One in Chicago. Is, I think it, it'd be it interesting says, if that's the case. I don't know. It says in the article, it's a permanent physical retail space. So it's not a pop-up. Okay. Now, what their <laughs> plans are in terms of expansion, um, that's not mentioned. If you had to bet, will we see any more of these? Um, yes. Yes, because the, the article does say that this is being paid for by the Solana Foundation, and they're they're the ones like they're the ones covering all the costs of the store, and their goal is to you know help build out the Solana ecosystem. And I would think if they've committed to this retail model permanently in New York City, in other words, not like a three month pop up, you have to believe that it's part of some broader plan. I, I mean, th this just makes me even more. It makes me hate it even more, to be honest, right? If we see like 12 retail stores, again, for a product that is inherently digital, and like, I don't, I don't really get it. If the goal is to sign up my grandmother, I don't think it achieves that really either. She's not going to wander into the Solana store and go like, hey, guys, what's going on here, right? Like, <laughs> sign me up. That's true. But like, you do see this like with even, you know, like I think back to when Tesla like famously put like, 
showrooms in the mall. And like you could argue, yes, you do need to go see a car. It's a physical item to get the difference. But it, it was a different kind of direct to consumer than what the way cars have been sold for hundreds of years. Um, and it kind of worked. So I, I, you know, I, I don't know. I would bet two things happen with this. One, they get bogged down with like a bunch of the noobs who come in and they set up their wallet that like a week later, the wallet, they can't figure out how to make it work. And so there's like a lot of people wandering in the store, like where, where'd my Bitcoin go? Right? Like <laughs> there's a lot of that. And then, and then the second group, like they buy the NFT in the store and then, and then they don't know why they can't take home like the physical thing on the wall that they thought they just bought. <laughs> like, I, I yeah. feel like it's going to be 50, 50 between unhappy experiences and like 50% that maybe walk away having you learned don't have something. a lot of faith in the in the people the intelligence of the people of your old your old neighborhood I, I don't have a lot of faith in retail unless it's truly an experience right and and it's truly for a physical product that is an experience like apple stores work because you can touch and feel and the you know the macbook and like like it's not just because they're educating you and it's not just because the geek squad is there it is it is a physical good uh, with digital goods, this just seems like a waste. But uh, I mean, time will tell. We'll see. Maybe uh, you'll have to go check it out, Jeff, I guess. Right. You'll have to go see me uh, yeah. and, and we'll report back. How about that? <laughs> it's my homework. <laughs> Good homework. Um, let's talk about uh, Minecraft in the news. Minecraft, you know, uh, I know we're, we're a Metaverse and Web3 podcast, but uh, Minecraft has taken a stance here. And, and the headline is, Popular block game, <laughs> like I, I always love when like non gaming endemic um, outlets report on anything gaming. Popular block game Minecraft says no to NFTs and the blockchain. So Mojang Studios, which is owned by Microsoft, they make Minecraft. They've come out and they've said we are not going to do NFTs, NFTs are not, they say, oh, let me read the statement directly. NFTs are not inclusive of all of our community and create a scenario of the haves and have nots. Mojang also said that the mindset NFTs would introduce into Minecraft would tarnish players' long-term enjoyment of the game. The company expressed concern that players would spend more time appraising NFTs values and trying to make money through Minecraft over playing the game itself. So. There's a ban on NFTs, but they're saying they're going to pay close attention to how the technology evolves, right? They're, they're, they're not ruling it out forever. They say they have no plans of implementing blockchain into Minecraft right now. So Minecraft, you know, maybe the best selling game of all time by some counts, 238 million copies sold. Um, what do you make of them taking the stand, essentially banning NFTs? From their ecosystem i mean the cynic in me says you know that this is just like a closed platform wanting to keep the platform closed and make the money themselves right right like they they want to be the ones selling the digital goods and getting all the money rather than having it be open transactions and kind of a lot of the benefits of the of the blockchain uh one of the things we've also talked a lot about is how the existing games that have massive player bases really don't have an incentive to be interoperable. And we both identified interoperability as one of the main like benefit, the, one of the actually probably only benefits that we can see currently of having blockchain in games is being able to take things from one game to another. Well, if you're Minecraft and you're literally the 800 pound gorilla, you're arguably, I don't know, probably top five game currently in terms of player base. Well, yeah. why would you want to make your game interoperable, interoperable with anything? Because that just means that people are going to be leaving your game, not coming into your game. So I, they really don't have a big incentive to, to integrate the blockchain and make it more open. So that's, that's, I guess, number one. So I do want to hit them a bit on that. Having said that, some of their points around tarnishing long-term engagement and creating like a world of haves and have-nots did resonate with me a little bit. Because I think that's something mm. we've talked a lot about you know, within within our conversations on this podcast is that once you incorporate this financial mechanism, and that's really what the blockchain is currently, is like financializing games with earning component, putting dollar amounts and tradability to different assets, you do kind of tarnish the fun factor or so far that yeah. has been. So I, I guess I, I, I come down on both sides of this one where I, I think <laughs> they're doing it probably for nefarious, like 
nefarious is the wrong word. They're they're doing it not altruistically per se. Yeah. Yeah. But I, yeah. I think they're probably right in their assessment of things. Yeah, I think you're spot on on the first part, Jeff. Like the the whole incentives thing has always been my you know my rallying cry against web3 games in general right like it's just you you create incentives that take away from the fun the actual fun of the game and people start to focus on you know other things that for the reality is have nothing to do with fun so you know mojang has this interesting sort of past and and you know without sort of diving too deep into it they really have been a company up until maybe more recently that was very very much focused on their player base and fun and trying to deliver what their player base wants right like this is not out of the ordinary in terms of like messaging from them i i so like even though you say they're not doing this altruistically i think it's in line with the culture at mojang slash minecraft right it's i slash microsoft even i'll extend it to that right like there is a i think a culture that understands gaming within microsoft maybe better than any of the big tech companies and and because they understand that culture better um and the, the and the gaming sort of ecosystem better this to me is evidence of that and they're coming out and they don't want to alienate anyone in their player base right and so I think it's it's an interesting stand. I think they're gonna history is gonna prove them right on this one, because until someone has figured out why gamers should care about NFTs beyond just making money in games, right? Why it makes the game more fun, everyone's just wasting their time, sort of thing, right? And so, I, I like the stance they took. It's measured, right? We're banning it for now because it doesn't make the game any more fun, and we think it creates things that make the game less fun in fact um or situations essentially and but we're going to keep watching it right they didn't rule it out and they it's literally in the statement that they're going to keep an eye on it and so i think that's about as good as we can expect from a company this big uh and a game this big and i give them i maybe i'm not take like my, i'm my view is much less cynical on this specifically Yes, they're protecting their their ecosystem, but like if tomorrow they opened it up to a zillion NFTs, I don't think like anyone would stop playing Minecraft. You know what I mean? Like Minecraft would be just as popular as it is today. Um, so I, I don't see too much risk if, you know, because for, first of all, to open it up, just to finish on this point, like a Roblox would also have to open up to let me take my you know, diamond axe from Minecraft and use it somehow in Roblox. And that's just, ever, they know that. Like, decide, but will, will that ever be possible between those two games specifically? No. I mean, it's a, as, it's as, a, as, such as a longer conversation, but I just. Yeah, that's it. such a longer, like, like a short term, <laughs> long term. Like, will we see consolidation? Will we see technologies that allow interoperability despite? what the developers want, right? Like there may be ways to tunnel the walled gardens essentially, right? Things like that. So we'll see, but uh, like as it stands with current technology and current sort of the way the companies are structured today, no, I, I don't, there's no incentive to, and the gamers aren't like demanding it. No one's like, there's, there's not 50 million kids going, please let me use my diamond ax and Roblox, right? It's just, it doesn't exist. So, um, Anyways, I just want to bring up the second part of this uh, story, which is, let me read this headline. Epic won't ban NFT games in response to Minecraft stance, Tim Sweeney says. And, and the subheadline here says, stores and operating system makers shouldn't interfere by forcing their views onto others. So Tim Sweeney, forever the crusader, um, in response to Minecraft saying, uh, you know, we're going to ban essentially NFTs from our games for now. Came out and reminded everyone that Epic is not banning NFTs, which is not new because he has said this before, but he took the, um, took the opportunity to say it again and, and added that it's wrong. I guess he used this word to interfere in how developers make their games. Um, what do you think of Tim Sweeney's well, comments here? Tim Sweeney. Jeff? I mean, he never misses an opportunity to play the defender of the common man, yeah. common gamer, yeah. if you will. 
So yeah. good on him again. So it's like they have a great PR team. Anytime there's a, a story like this, it's like immediately like a, yeah. a quote comes out like, we are still not banning NFTs from games. The decision that we made seven months ago. Still doing it. It's just wrong. These platforms. It's like, okay, we kind of get it. But having said that, it's smart. I and mean, they, they are the challenger brand, challenger platform. They, they're losing on most fronts. Um, we've had this debate before whether how successful they are or how much of a failure the Epic Game Store has been. But regardless, if we disagree on how much of a failure or where they are in that process, it, it, they are clearly the challenger brand. They're clearly the hunter um, versus Steve and others. So it's smart on them to try to find an angle, right? This is the one maybe part of, of Steam's armor that has like a jink in it. You know, like if, if we get to a point where people want to actually play web three games and they can't play them on steam. Epic game store has a massive opportunity there. So I still maintain that's the case. The question is just like, when do we get to that point where people actually want to play web three games and Epic game store becomes the place to do it. I don't think we're there yet. I remember we talked a few episodes back. There was a big game launching. I can't even now remember which one it was, but I remember we debated whether it would be kind of a big moment for the Epic Game Store and for Web3 Gaming, given that I can't even remember the name of the game, I'm guessing it it, it was not a real supernova <laughs> moment. But uh, maybe, you re- maybe you remember that debate. Okay. Like, it was I a don't. game that was launching, but I can't even remember now what it was. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. No, it, I don't. I don't get Tim Sweeney. Right? Like I. I, I don't. I, I don't. I don't really understand why he has taken on this fight right like he's got a, a totally dominant game in its genre like in fortnite or at least a cash cow you know it's not totally dominant, but it's a cash cow he has an engine that has 50 percent of the market share right like i've never understood why he takes on these crusades because it doesn't move his business forward in any way today and so your argument, I think, is a good one. And I think it's the, arg- the argument uh, that it has the most validity, right? Which is he's making these arguments today because he thinks at some point in the future, all of this catches on, right? And, and Epic Games will be the only one left standing, right? Everyone will be years behind because he saw the future first. And... And I think he couldn't be any more wrong. I think he couldn't be any more wrong. What, what, when I see these articles, what I truly believe is Tim Sweeney has become so far removed from actually making games that he doesn't really know what a fun game is anymore. Right? And, and if you just look at his Twitter feed, 98% of it is him talking about highly technical programming related things right like oh you know in objective c uh using an array is is less efficient than using a you know like you know like this, this kind of like hardcore programmer stuff and then the rest is his crusade against apple against valve against like literally anyone who who has taken maybe a more measured approach to this it's his crusade or his like highly technical stuff and I, I really am starting to believe that he's not really, he doesn't really care about making games anymore. And he's not really in the business of making games anymore himself, right? That, that's just not part of what he sees as his responsibility as CEO of Epic, which makes me very concerned because as a games company, if the CEO doesn't care about the games you make, this is this is the start of a big downward slide. Um, you can reference Activision Blizzard as the perfect proof of this. Um, and, and so the scenario I see more likely to play out, and I've said this before, I think is Epic is going to publish some web three game that is complete garbage and it's not garbage. It's like, a, it's a scam. It's some Chinese scam of some kind. And some kid in Utah is going to, is going to lose, you know, $2,000 of his parents' money. And it's going to be front page news on the Washington post. And it will tarnish Web3 games and set them back a year or two at least, right? 
and totally set back Epic. They'll have to issue an apology. They'll have to say, we're doing more moderation and curation. You know, that they'll have to backpedal all of this, all of the big statements he's making, like, we're never going to tell developers what to do, right? Like, okay, well, I'm going to put up a Web3 scam game and then you can't tell me what to do. Like, okay. Um, and he's just going to look silly. Like, I, I don't see how this ends other than them looking silly and and people getting hurt as a consequence of, of of a religious argument is what I see here. It's not measured. It's not really logical. It's just become religion for him. Um, Do you think so? So I, 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 I like your prognostication. I think I actually tend to like that is a decent likely scenario, not to the specifics clearly that you detailed, but I, I think <laughs> that outcome is, is plausible if they're not doing the content moderation. They're not, if they're just allowing anything on there. I don't obviously know whether that's the case or not. They may some moderation but do you think that the core of the strategy if it's not driven by this sort of ideological zeal is it a good strategy to say hey we're the challenger this could be the next big thing our competitors have shunned it let's give it a, let's give it a chance you know it could be it could be the thing that vaults us into competition if i was a 50 person startup right the contrarian strategy here makes total sense because the downside's very small and the upside's massive if I'm the only one that's right, right? The problem is Epic is not a 50-person startup. The downside for them is very large. It's tens of billions of dollars, right? Like there is a huge amount of downside. So like maybe in his head, there's still that 20-person startup. And, and, and there, if I'm him, I would do the exact same thing. Even if I didn't believe it, just because the the you know the the risk reward math works in my favor, right? So on the ten percent chance I'm right, there's a ton of upside. On the ninety percent chance I'm wrong, ah, what do I lose? Like my rinky dink startup, okay? Um, and so you know, the, it's your your point is a fantastic one. I just think not in the case of a company as big and value valuable as epic games i mean it's just they're not they're not a startup makes sense um let's talk about two companies that are definitely not startups uh call it going after each other in the metaverse space here and this was uh zuckerberg so we were you know big ceos making big comments this week i guess is the theme um zuckerberg says meta and apple are in very deep philosophical competition that's a direct quote to build the metaverse. So he says, this is a competition of philosophies and ideas is what he told employees recently. And I'll just read the quote. He says, this is a competition of philosophies and ideas where they believe, this, they as an Apple, that by doing everything themselves and tightly integrating, that they build a better consumer experience, Zuckerberg said of the brooding rivalry. And we believe that there's a lot to be done in specialization across different companies and that will allow a much larger ecosystem to exist. He said that Meta will position itself as the more open, cheaper alternative to Apple, which is expected to announce their first AR headset as soon as later this year. Um, side note, it's also mentioned in the article, they helped, Meta helped sta uh, stand up the Metaverse Open Standards Group with Microsoft, Epic, and others. So um, what do you think of this like deep philosophical differences sort of um well, i agree i mean apple has always been famously like the closed platform and on mobile android you know has always been the open platform so i think zuckerberg is saying okay for vr we're going to be that open platform and i think android of the metaverse android of vr and apple presumably will keep their their walled garden uh type approach it's interesting to me because i feel like we always complain about um Facebook or Meta kind of trying to be the one company that rules the metaverse. Like I don't often hear that when people describe the metaverse, like, well, it's not just going to be Facebook owning it. Like that, like almost like there's a lot of disdain towards Facebook's approach. Cause I, th I think Facebook by the name change, just being so vocal about it, people have this perception that that is what they're trying to do. They're trying to like own the whole ecosystem. So it's interesting to see Zuckerberg like kind of smart, almost like, smartly say hey well, that's not what we're trying to do we're trying to be like an open platform uh apple's the real you know the real bad guy here that's trying to like own <laughs> everything so there i think it's a it's a smart like savvy way for him to be framed 
fast forward like five, maybe 10 years, even Jeff, like, who do you think, like, what, what do you think is the, the positioning between these two companies five years from today? Like, what does that relationship look like? And how, how are they, how are they different or similar from a metaverse strategy? Obviously. It's a good question. I think I probably have more, con- oh, man. I was going to say I have more confidence in Apple just in their ability to build hardware, their ability to, to, to coax developers onto their platform. Um, having said that, Meta's cl- ahead in the VR hardware sense. And I know you, you've talked on prior episodes about how Oculus is really the, the um, Trojan horse, if you will, for the, for the Metaverse, for, for Meta. So I don't know. I don't have a ton of conviction, honestly. Curious to hear your thoughts, actually. You know. Apple is notoriously good at waiting for someone else to pioneer something and then making it better and more expensive and more profitable. (laughs) Um, You know, uh, so, you know, in that sense, I, I don't think I don't discount Apple, right? Even if it's a closed ecosystem, and I've said many times, the true capital and metaverse will need to be interoperable and things like that. But, you know, Apple has a billion people who will buy just about anything they put out, right? Like there's a base there that is so deep in their ecosystem and the ability to prime a pump with that many people, that many users is a superpower that I think only Apple has today. Um, I th- I think five years from now, we'll still talk- be talking about these two going head to head. I know that's kind of a non-answer, but I think both will exist and we'll still be discussing sort of how they're figuring out how to coexist um, in the same way. You know, it would be awesome if we could use iMessage across Apple and Android. Right? How, many, how many times do you hear people complain about that? That hasn't been solved yet. It's a much simpler problem to solve. Yeah. Um, but from a user perspective, right, we'd all love it to be solved. And I think we'll be complaining about this five years from now that, you know, I've got assets in this in the Apple metaverse and I've got assets in the Facebook metaverse. And like, you know, how nice would it be if I could just hang out with my friends who are on, you know, the Apple metaverse? It is just things. I think the reality is five years is not a long enough time period for those things to sort themselves out. You ask me 20 years, I think there will be. There, the, the the reality is these things will be solved, but um, in the in the shorter term, I think you're just going to have these competitive viewpoints existing um, concurrently. Um, Jeff, I don't know if you have any other thoughts on that, but that uh, that wraps up this week's show. That uh, I feel flew like by. that flew by. I know. Um, as always, a blast, and as always. I just want to thank our listeners who tune in every week. Remind them, make sure you subscribe to the podcast so that you get notified when a new episode drops. And go subscribe to our sister podcast, Meta Woman, which covers um, women operating in the gaming and Web3 space. It's it's an interview show. Content's amazing. Um, so go subscribe to that. And if you love the juice, go follow him, Jeff Cohen 23 and go check out uh, the live stream that Jeff and I do every single Wednesday, 2.30 p.m. Eastern time. It's a lot of fun. We cover gaming stuff more broadly, not Web3 not web and Metaverse specifically, but gaming stuff more broadly. So go check that out. Uh, and as always, guys, don't forget the most important thing. The future is fun. We'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us here on Meta Business. Make sure to subscribe to this podcast everywhere you get your podcasts, leave a five-star review, and tell your friends, family, and colleagues all about us. Also, make sure to follow Meta TV on all socials to get more of the best Metaverse content anywhere. Tune in every week for another episode of Meta Business.